Buy my novel, Escape from the Village, from major booksellers online. Go to escapevillage.com. Subscribe to my Substack. Go to fountainheadforum.substack.com. Thank you. This is Fountainhead Forum 70. I have Dr. Lawrence Reed, who is a longtime president of the Foundation for Economic Education. He has been one of the greatest ambassadors for free market economics ever. Uh, he was president of the Mackinac Center in Michigan, and uh, he uh, traveled to uh, com- and has traveled all over the world. He's going to talk partially, somewhat, about his his trips to communist Poland before the before Poland became a free market country again. How are you today? Hey, just terrific, uh, Chris, and thanks yeah. for having me. Just a quick update: I retired from the president role at uh, Fee. Uh, four years ago. So I'm president emeritus now, very active one, effectively full time. But uh, now I get to do what I most enjoy, and that is writing and speaking. Yeah, and you've certainly produced a lot of content. Uh, Thank you. So uh, how how much, uh, how often did you go over to the the uh, former communist? For, first of all, I guess, how, how did you get started in free market economics? And how did you end up going to all the some of the going to Poland and possibly some of the other Eastern Bloc countries before they were free markets or at least moving toward free markets. Okay, well, I got my start uh, as a teenager uh, when the Soviets invaded Czechoslovakia. It led to um, a big demonstration in downtown Pittsburgh, about 25 miles from my home, um, where uh, students were protesting the Soviet invasion. And I got a bus ticket and went up there and participated. And uh, at that time, when you joined Young Americans for Freedom, which was the group then sponsoring that demonstration, you got a lot of material from FEE, Foundation for Economic Education, including classics like Henry Hazlitt's Economics of One Lesson and Frederick Bastiat's The Law and some others. And the message was, if you want to be a good anti-communist, you better know your economics, your human nature, your moral philosophy and your economics, lots of other stuff. Um, And so that set me on a path that has defined my life, which is in one way or another, as a professor or think tank president, advancing liberty uh, here and abroad. And of course, in the days of the Cold War, uh, and having gotten started through the uh, Soviet activity in Czechoslovakia, I was very much animated to uh, help people to whatever extent I could, who were behind the Iron Curtain under the thumb of the Soviet uh, evil empire. And so I began in 1986 uh, doing some travels to East European uh, and other communist countries, also in Africa. And uh, my whole purpose in those uh, trips as a freelance uh, journalist was to uncover as much as I could about the underground opposition to those communist regimes. And I found by far the most lively, vibrant, and inspiring underground to be in Poland, which I visited for the first time uh, in 1986. That's that's very interesting. Was 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 that by chance connected to Lech Walesa solid the solidarity or was it completely Uh, Well, in 1986, Poland was still under martial law uh, declared by the communist government in 1981. And when it did that in 81, of course, uh, Solidarity was one of the organizations it intended to suppress. So uh, this was a dark period for Poland. Uh, You recall a few years before that, before martial law, you had the rise of Solidarity, John Paul II's visit as Pope in 1979 and uh, uh, lots of Polish people rising up against the communist regime. Uh, the communists uh, squelched that with martial law. So when I went in 86, it was uh, two and a half years before the big changes when the communists would be kicked out and when the country was still effectively under uh, a one party communist uh, dictatorship and with martial law in many ways still lingering. So it was very much uh, a sub rosa visit every night. I stayed in a different home to be one step ahead of the government. Um, And uh, my visits uh, and interviews were with people who were active in the resistance, whether it be underground printers, underground insurance companies, you name it. If it had a public and legal 
uh, aspect, it had a private and underground and illegal counterpart because the Polish underground became so uh, vastly extensive by the late 1980s. That's interesting. I, I wonder if they took lessons from all the Poles who hid Jews during World War II and, and all that stuff. Was there always an underground or? Oh, yeah. Poland has a long history of uh, that kind of resistance. In fact, for 123 years, from yes. 1795 to 1918, uh, there was no Poland. It was partitioned and occupied by three major powers, Austria-Hungary, Prussia, and Russia. And in the Russian portion of what was Poland, uh, there was a very active effort by the Russian government to uh, extinguish uh, Polish history and uh, aspects of Polish culture. And that drove a lot of Poles underground in the 19th century. So even Maria uh, or Marie Curie, the great physicist uh, who won two Nobel Prizes, um, she, her maiden name was Skladowska, she was Polish. She went to an underground university where she earned her undergraduate degree in the 1880s, I think it was, and, uh, or 70s, thereabouts. So Poland has a long history of resisting occupying powers, and it, it had become an expert in underground activity by the 1980s. Uh, that that is glorious. Yeah, I, I didn't, yeah. So, so how'd you? So you actually got arrested. How did that happen? Well, I was there uh, in the country. Uh, you could say legally in the sense that I came through customs, uh, but illegally in the sense that I never. Uh, declared, as I was required to, that I was in any way a journalist. That's what made my visit illegal. And of course, if the government had known uh, who it was I was meeting with and what my intent was, they probably would have kept me from uh, ever entering in the first place. But um, uh, I thought that uh, everything was okay. Uh, day after day in my trip, I was uh, conducting my interviews and a lot of it was you know, sort of cloak and dagger blinking a light to let the occupants know that uh, my escort and I were uh, coming to interview them, hopefully not to be caught by the police. But somewhere along the way, uh, the Polish government got wind of what I was doing because uh, when I got to customs to leave the country at the Warsaw airport, the uh, passport officer looked at my passport and immediately got on the telephone and uh, called over three armed and uniformed uh, guards. And that is what began a two or three hour detainment uh, where they, uh, I was strip searched. They took my tapes and film, interrogated me, but didn't get anything out of me. Um, I didn't know if the plane had been kept on the ground or not. Um, uh, lo and behold, it turned out it was uh, because when they were done with me, uh, they told me the plane is still here and you have to get on it and leave and don't come back. And I tried several times in 87, 88, and early 89 to come back into Poland when it was still communist, but every time my visa request was denied. So they kept good records. Um, not until November of 89, uh, within a few months after the communists were thrown out, that uh, was I allowed to re-enter. And what a glorious revisit that was, because a lot of the folks who had been a part of my first trip, my underground trip, were now members of the new parliament. They were above ground in every way in a free Poland, and we were celebrating that as we saw the wall come down a couple of weeks before in Germany and uh, the Velvet Revolution in Czechoslovakia at the same time I was there uh, in November of 89 in Poland. Big changes that fall for sure. So uh, that's why they arrested me. I, I think, if anything, that it was probably the lecture that I gave in Krakow at Jagiellonian University that got me into that trouble. Um, I was assured that uh, I could speak my mind because they, uh, my escort said, We've, you know, we know everybody who's going to be here. The government is not aware of it. I think somebody snitched, and that might yeah. be the best reason uh, why uh, they were waiting for me at the airport. Yeah, you, you never know who might snitch. I don't know. Yeah. Or been forced to snitch. Yeah. You just it's, don't know, yeah. It's always interesting, too. It, ha it happens at the airport if you're... I don't know if it had been 
better. Well, well, you you, you didn't really have any place you could have went to though that wasn't. Yeah, that's the narrow part that's of the funnel. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and and they held the plane for three hours. Wow, that's. Uh, yeah. Bet those other passengers weren't very happy about that. I'm sure they weren't. And I remember when I got on, yeah. uh, I'm sure everybody suspected I was the reason. But the pilot uh, in both English and Polish announced uh, his apologies and said the delay was due to technical or mechanical difficulties. <laughs> yeah. Of course, that was not true, but uh, that's what I'm sure he was told to say. Paul, the Poles really like Americans, don't they? I, I Oh, they do. Yeah, I yeah. remember hearing over and over again in the 80s. Uh, John Paul II was by far uh, the people of Poland's favorite person in the world, as you might imagine. He'd just been uh, named Pope, the first non-Italian one in 450 years from yeah. Poland. And uh, the second most popular person that poll after poll told me was Ronald Reagan. And they, when I asked why, they would say, well, because he, he called the Soviet empire an evil empire, and he was the first American president to uh, so uh, courageously call a spade a spade, and we appreciated that here in Poland. Yeah, what, what's also telling, too, is I, I think they still have much more hostility toward the Russians than they do toward the Germans. Uh, they they've seem to have made peace with the Germans, but... Yeah, uh, yeah, it's hard to say. Uh, it would be interesting to take a poll to find out who they dislike the most, but I would guess that you're right, especially in light of the uh, Russian invasion of uh, Ukraine. But they've uh, battled the Russians for a long time, and including that long period of occupation in the 19th century. Yeah. Uh, well, so, so yeah, and and you got you got an award from the the. The government uh, you know, of Poland too for your efforts uh, of spreading free markets in Poland. Yeah, that came as quite that? a surprise. Yeah, it's uh, uh, it's been announced, but the actual ceremony, uh, the date is still hanging fire. Uh, the last word I got was that it will likely be in late September in Warsaw at the presidential uh, palace. But it's it's the highest honor that Poland bestows upon a foreigner. And it's called the Grand Cross of the Order of Merit of the Republic of Poland. And in the president's announcement of this in 2022, he cited my activities in 1986 uh, underground as being uh, the principal reason, but also said uh, Poland appreciated the many things I've written about the country in the years since. I've probably written two dozen articles about Polish history and great heroes of, uh, of Poland. Yeah, like, uh, well, the one who comes to my mind is, is Pilsudski. Are there any others we should be aware of? But... Uh, Pilsudski, of course, was a bit of a mixed bag. He was not really free market. He, yeah. He certainly, uh, anybody can celebrate his victory over the Russians in the 1920-21 conflict that really did more than just save Poland uh, from uh, Lenin's invasion, it may have saved all of Western Europe because Lenin had plans to march as far west as he could go, but Poland stopped the Bolshevik army in uh, uh, August of 21. Um, About yeah, many, yeah, many great Polish heroes. One, uh, the bravest man uh, of any nationality I think I've ever heard of was a man named uh, Witold Pilecki. He was an underground uh, resistance fighter against both the Nazis and the Soviets when those two gangs of thugs invaded the country in September of 1939. And then when the underground got word that the Germans were building this huge complex near Krakow and that some of their, uh, their men perhaps had been sent there, he volunteered to get arrested by the Germans in the hope that they wouldn't kill him that they would send him perhaps to this place so from the inside he might create some kind of resistance or get information out. Well, what he, he got his wish and what he uh, got to report on from inside for the better part of three years was Auschwitz. Um, when he first was sent there, it was in its earlier days and the full magnitude of what that place would become so notoriously known for wasn't uh, yet spread out, but it was well before he finally escaped. And he uh, organized a resistance within Auschwitz 
that quietly uh, would uh, steal documents and smuggle them out. They even uh, constructed a, a crude radio transmitter and for several months were transmitting from inside Auschwitz to the outside world, hoping that uh, the world would learn of what was going on at this camp that was ultimately responsible for the killing of more than a million uh, people. And uh, uh, when he thought the Nazis were getting close to him, figuring out that there was something going on, he then had to escape and only 140 some people ever successfully escaped from Auschwitz. He was one of them and then uh, made his way to Warsaw in the latter stages of the war where he fought in the Battle of Warsaw. He was captured by the Germans again, but they didn't realize who he was or that he'd been at Auschwitz. He wasn't Jewish, so he didn't have a defining mark um, or other telltale sign that might tell them that. They just thought they had another Polish prisoner of war, so they threw him in a prisoner of war camp. After he was liberated from that uh, in 1945, when the war was over, um, he then, a few months later, went underground in his native Poland to spy on the Soviets because the underground began to sense that the Russians weren't going to leave Poland. They were digging in to occupy the place and uh, they needed information from behind the lines as to what the Soviets were really planning to do. So for two years, he spied on the Soviets inside Poland until his cover was blown. He was arrested, put on a public show trial, which you can see snippets of on YouTube to this day, and uh, then es executed in 1948 for espionage. Witold Pilecki, a great martyr for liberty, great hero of Poland, yeah. one of the bravest people uh, I've ever heard of. Wow, yeah, the, the other, yeah, and of course, I, I also think of Irina Sendler, who you know yeah. smuggled all those kids out. I mean, she's yeah. another, another one, yep. just working as a nurse. But yeah, it it is it is certainly tragic, but it sometimes brings brings. It's interesting how it brings out the best in people. And you know, I, I mean, about half the Jews that died in the Holocaust were Polish Jews. A very large number. You may be right. I don't recall if it was half, but a very large number. Yeah. Uh, and many of the German built. Uh, prisoner of war and and uh, extermination camps were built inside Poland, uh, even though the Polish government was in exile and had nothing to do with it. Yeah, yeah, and I, I you know, I don't think a lot of Americans or even a lot of anti-communists know anything about the 1920 Battle of Warsaw, which was just so important in stopping the communists. And yeah, it, it might very well have stopped them completely. It was, a, and that was when assured Poland's, new Poland's independence, so yeah. Yeah, and keep in mind, it didn't look all that uh, much of a stretch to Lenin that perhaps he could take not just Poland, but maybe Germany as well, because Germany was in the throes of chaos. Uh, yeah. uh, its inflation would, within a couple of years, become uh, drastic and destroy the economy, but it was in political turmoil. So uh, Lenin, you know, from the heady days of the Bolshevik victory in Moscow, thought, hey, now's our chance. Let's take Poland and go as far west as we can. But Poland bravely put a stop to it. Yeah, they didn't want to be ruled by the Russians anymore. No. Uh, what What do you, what, have you, how much have you paid attention to? The, you paid a lot of attention to Eastern, as well, well as one of my Polish friends says, it's Central Europe. But yeah. how, how much, have, what, what have you noticed about the, the country? Is Poland still, I mean, are most of these countries pretty much free market or are they, well, they're far freer than they were, yeah. without exception. Yeah. Uh, some have a, still uh, an awful lot of crony cronyism going on uh, because uh, they didn't manage the transition to free markets uh, well. Those with political power in some of those places, some of those countries, sort of rigged the uh, rigged the game a bit. But still, uh, there's no country in the former East European uh, Soviet bloc where you can be summarily jailed uh, for simply speaking your mind. Uh, there's considerably greater freedoms of speech and press and assembly and political competition from Poland to the, uh, uh, to the uh, Balkans. Um, uh, e economically, uh, things vary, but Poland is, uh, I don't recall where it stands on the index of economic freedom, but it's, it's uh, a, a quite a free nation. Uh, still has a ways to go, but uh, wow, big change from before. And you see it, uh, it's night and day, you know, the, the old gray 
Uh, as P.J. O'Rourke used to say, commie concrete of the communist days has been replaced by color and life and uh, robustness and vibrancy and happy people and smiles in the streets, uh, colorful store windows uh, that they didn't have for all those decades under communism. Yeah. You know, the buildings really tell you a lot. It, it, from what I from what I've seen, it seems like Estonia has done the best as far as going to free markets. What, yeah, and it may be. Yeah. I think it was for a time may still be ranked the freest uh, economically of the East, former East European communist bloc countries. Estonia certainly has, and their story is very moving as well. It's been documented in a film. I think you can get it, you can see it on YouTube, maybe get it on Amazon called uh, The Singing Revolution, The Singing Revolution. Very moving, and it tells the story of not just Estonia, primarily them, but also the other two uh, Baltic countries yes. that really uh, threw off the, the Soviet yoke. And in Estonia's case, did it uh, largely because people started spontaneously singing illegal songs that uh, sang the virtues of their na nationality and of freedom in public gatherings and in stadiums. Uh, and the communists couldn't put a stop to it. And finally, uh, they mustered enough courage to just declare their independence and get rid of the Soviets uh, altogether. Yes, I have seen that movie. What, 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 what do you think? Of, and I, I, I know Václav Klaus in the Czech Republic's done a lot of good too. What, what do you think? Where do you think they've not done very well, and what? Where do you think they've not done so well? Well, uh, in terms of economics, uh, as I say, they uh, some of those countries uh, made the mistake of uh, giving some special privileges and advantages to the uh, already powerful. Uh, whenever they started the transition from communism to freer markets. And the result was that uh, some rather odious people used those political favors uh, to uh, get rich quick. And that, that made, uh, left a bad taste in the mouth, naturally, of uh, many uh, other people in those countries. Uh, they thought, well, these were the guys who were at least allies of the old oppressors, and now they're, they're rich because they got these special favors. So... You know, that's always a danger. Uh, and that's really, that's not a fault of capitalism or free markets. It really is another indictment of a kind of socialism. Yes. Uh, it, it's the leftover socialism of big government passing out favors that uh, really is what's objectionable here. So they didn't get that quite right. But, but still, it's hard to say that, uh, you know, they knew everything they needed to know at that time to do it right, or that the right people were all in the right places. I mean, that wasn't, I'm sure, the case. But by and large, I uh, don't want to sell the East European short, uh, because from the Baltic states, through Poland, through uh, the Czech Republic, and Hungary, Hungary and Slovakia, and Romania, uh, and the Balkans, all those countries are much freer than they were before. And um, th their governments uh, come and go because there are free elections, and uh, it's a lot better place than it was. Certainly. Uh, yeah, you know, also, I, I was fortunate last year to go to, as well as they call them, Hayastan and Sakartvelo. We call them Armenia and Georgia. And I, Georgia looked like it was 15 years ahead of Armenia. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Uh, the, the, but, the, you know, the, I still felt free in both countries, but the, the architecture in Tbilisi was so much prettier than the architecture in Yerevan. Uh, yes, and uh, I have to give a lot of credit to the Georgians. I have some great friends there uh, involved with uh, free market think tanks. Uh, Gia Janderi and Pata Shazaliza, uh, if they're watching, I, uh, I pay yeah. tribute to you. Uh, they uh, have done a remarkable job and are one of the freest countries now in the world, even though they are, you know, sitting right next to the to the Russians, and uh, a portion of their country is occupied by the Russians. Uh, they still have managed a, an economy and a society uh, much freer than anybody might have expected just 30, 40 years ago. Yeah, I, I, I think the smaller countries can rise and fall a lot faster. Yeah, probably so. And, you know, there's something to be said for, uh, I mean, socialism is dastardly and, and evil and counterproductive everywhere it's tried. But when it's imposed upon you by a foreign power 
that isn't on your list of most popular places to begin with, uh, then you're probably even quicker to get rid of it. Uh, and that certainly helps in those countries because socialism to them was not so much a homegrown thing as it was imposed upon them by uh, the hated Soviet empire. Yeah, and they they don't even really claim Stalin as their own. I I mean they have a they have you can go visit his house, but they really don't want to have anything to do with him. And yeah, yeah, and for good reason. I, yeah, I, I I and you know I I know because I think you live in the American state of Georgia. I I, I usually call, I I I'm I refer to it as Sockart Velo just because I don't want the confusion. <laughs> you know, it's, it's and it's a cool name. You know, it's a, it's a lovely place though. I, yeah. yeah. What. what you know, did you ever think we would still be fighting these communists 30 years later? Well, of course, at the time of the big changes in 1989, yeah. I was so thrilled because I didn't know. I, I, I sensed it was coming, but I, if you have asked me a few months before it did, is it, is it imminent? I might have said, I don't think so, but it's going to happen. I just hope to live to see it. It all happened so fast and so much sooner than I thought it would. Um, I, I think at that time I said I, to myself that, wow, we've gotten rid of this. It's going to maybe be a, you know, a leftover here and there around the world, like North Korea, Cuba, but <clears throat> by and large, communism is no longer going to be the threat. Well, it is again, uh, but in a different form, not so much in a uh, massive nuclear power, but rather in uh, our own institutions of so-called higher education where the principles of, uh, of Marxism, of Karl Marx, the founder of this uh, dastardly philosophy, um, where his principles are sort of embraced and taught. And uh, it's very sad uh, to see that happen. Uh, we're going to have to fight this battle, I guess, uh, for a long time to come. Uh, so we're still fighting communism, but it isn't so much sitting in Moscow as it is sitting in your university around the corner. And, and we, we knew that 30 years ago. That, and, and, and Jordan Peterson just simply asked the question of how, how much proof do we need? Yeah, yeah. Uh, you, you know, and he's and Jordan sir, Peterson certainly is not a communist. But. No, but uh, the sad thing is so many Americans are completely oblivious to it or just don't just don't care, don't know and don't care to know. Uh, because, you know, in many cases, the government's paying for their kid to go to college. And uh, so why should they care? Uh, and, uh, you know, uh, it's just a shame that many Americans are complicit in the undermining of their own liberty uh, by professors who live down the street from them and don't give a damn uh, uh, and don't care to do anything about it. Uh, I hope there's a, a, an awakening taking place that will change that. But right now, that's the, one of the saddest things in the country to see that uh, yeah. we throw money, more money every year at government education, the universities and the failing K-12 system without really uh, scrutinizing uh, the lousy deal that we're getting for the money we're spending. Yeah. And, you know, it, it is telling that Marx is not really popular with economics professors, but he is popular in some of the other uh, some of the other circles. Yeah. Generally speaking, he's more popular in those disciplines that are um, the most worthless, you might say. Yeah. Uh, you see a lot of it in sociology, which a lot of that would be worthless even in the absence of Marxist indoctrination, but gender studies, you know, this nonsense stuff that uh, uh, for which there are virtually no jobs uh, in the productive private sector. That That's where you, you get an awful lot of concentration of this uh, uh, craziness. Oh, yeah. Uh, for yeah. Marx. Yeah. Yeah. Anybody who knows economics knows that he was a, a charlatan from the word go. Yeah, I, it's truly remarkable. And, you know, and I, I've got to ask, too, I mean, what did you think of what happened in 2020? It seemed like we were all living through a certain degree of communism. Yeah, sure. <clears throat> it sure gave us a taste, didn't it, of uh, what uh, total government or, or certainly a huge government can do to you. <clears throat> I'd like to think Americans uh, have learned their lessons on that and would never allow that to happen again the next time there might be some some uh, uh, emergency uh, situation like a pandemic. I hope we've learned uh, that government doesn't have all the answers, that its first recourse is invariably 
uh, those options that involve force uh, and uh, that those options generally have a greater downside than they ever have upside. Uh, that's certainly been the case with COVID. Anybody who looks at the evidence now knows that the lockdowns were counterproductive, the mask requirements were silly and, and uh, ineffective. I mean, for crying out loud, everybody ended up with it anyway. Uh, so that doesn't say much about the effectiveness of all these various measures that the government took. But we know that on the downside, uh, we not only set back the education of, uh, of many young people, we forced uh, many into uh, mental states of, of, uh, that were suicidal or uh, very uh, depression focused and, and just caused a lot of mental issues around the country. Physical issues too, the, the treatments that people needed the, uh, to survive um, cancer or for cancer to be detected early were foregone so we could throw everything at the COVID thing. And uh, we'll continue to pay the price for that in early deaths from diseases we didn't fight as we should have during the COVID pandemic. So um, um, yeah, it was frightening to see and hopefully Americans have learned something from it. I, I hope so. I, you know, is, is the intellectual life in the, the former, in the former, in the central Europe, is it that pretty much pro-capitalist or is it? Well, you know, uh, this is true uh, probably in every country that has a, a, a large publicly subsidized uh, university system. Uh, that's where you still find, even in countries that are otherwise relatively free, that's where you still find a lot of people who are probably unemployable anywhere else. Uh, they are employed uh, in those places and are propagating ideas uh, that have long since flopped. The communism, socialism, various isms of the left. So even, even in Poland, there's plenty of that still going on. Uh, uh, but the general public is not sympathetic <clears throat> in most of Eastern Europe uh, to the socialism that their uh, parents and grandparents had to labor through. And even if they're not completely understanding of or sold on freedom and free markets, uh, they know that their future really depends on more on that uh, than it does returning to what didn't work before. So, uh, you know, it's an ongoing battle, um, but uh, I'm actually uh, as optimistic, if not more so for some of those countries than I am for our own. Yeah. I, I you know, in some cases I'm, Sometimes I wonder too if it's just because we've gotten so far removed from having to survive. Uh, you know, you know. I mean, you, you go back a thousand years; nobody could ever afford to go on strike because we were so poor. It's yeah, and 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 we couldn't have these wealth distribution schemes. And, and I do find it interesting if I try, if I go to Mexico, I see all these. I see so many little businesses just. Mm -hmm. A business that you could start for maybe a thousand or two thousand dollars, and you don't even see those in America. It's, uh, yeah, one of the greatest things you can do for for the poor is to get barriers out of their way uh, yeah. to accumulate capital to start their own business, uh, to be enterprising. Uh, but our, you know, governments, federal, state, and local in America, so often erect barriers to that through things like the minimum wage law, which prices the unskilled out of the labor market, uh, to uh, ordinances in some of our major cities that uh, forbid you from starting a business in your own home, which means in effect, uh, even if you have no capital at all, you've got to go out and buy a building uh, because the government won't let you do it in, their, in your home. There's just endless ways in which busybodies in government who think they're doing uh, good uh, are actually doing harm. And uh, uh, it, it's a dirty, rotten shame. But uh, I, nonetheless, I am still uh, quite inspired <clears throat> by the measures that so many people take to get around uh, these things. It's sometimes it's what they even do is illegal, but you have to cheer them on because these stupid regulations uh, deserve to be ignored. Um, I remember, uh, I've told the story many times of uh, when uh, I lived for my first 23 years in western Pennsylvania near the Ohio border. Pennsylvania had a milk control board, uh, it still does, that fixes the price of milk in Pennsylvania. And at that time, it was high enough beyond what 
unregulated milk in Ohio sold for, that you could sneak across the line, buy cheap milk in Ohio and bring it over and sell it to your neighbors. And if you had enough of it, sold enough of it, uh, you could make a few bucks for that short drive. And my father uh, and I did that on many Saturdays. We drove 11 miles to Negley, Ohio, bought as much milk as we could put in the car, covered it with a blanket. He told me on the way home, uh, you know, if the cops pull us over, don't move the blanket, don't tell them we got milk in the car. I mean, we were milk smugglers. Uh, and But that that's an example of a stupid counterproductive law that served nobody but Pennsylvania dairy interests who didn't want cheap competition from Ohio. It hurt the poor uh, far more than it ever did the rich. Yeah, it's uh, yeah, it's funny how they end up, the people they allegedly want to help end up getting hurt the most. You know, I, and I often, I wanted to ask you too, I, I think one of the most valiant attempts to do an end round around this is, is Bitcoin. What do you think about Bitcoin? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I certainly, from its inception, have welcomed it into the uh, what there is in the way of competition among monies. As you know, governments uh, over the uh, our lifetimes and for several generations now have pretty much monopolized the production of money. Uh, <clears throat> I'm one of those Austrian economists who believes in competition in the privately provided uh, medium of exchange that markets would produce. So I don't like government money to begin with. But when uh, Bitcoin came along, I thought, well, hallelujah, I don't know uh, if it's going to be the money of the future or even a money of the future. But the fact is, it's taught a lot of people already an important lesson that money doesn't have to be a monopoly of the government. And if the government ruins it, as it typically does uh, enough, uh, <clears throat> it will prompt the market to discover and uh, distribute alternatives. And that's really a big reason for the emergence of Bitcoin. It has a ways to go to actually be a widely circulated medium of exchange. But, um, you know, given the right circumstances, uh, a runaway inflation and of the paper dollar issued by the government could, uh, could produce that. I, I'm glad Bitcoin is around and some of its other competitors as well, because you never know. Um, the government could so ruin its own product that uh, we'll be glad someday that there's a, a competing media of exchange out, out there that we could turn to. Yeah, I, yes, and there are thousands of competitors, although none of them have quite taken on them. And, and a lot of them are scams, but yeah, it's a definitely, I, I think the main thing is the transaction costs and the ease of use, but I think it certainly is. A, yeah. It's opened the door to what could certainly, and, and I don't think it's a, I don't know how the, the government can mess it up and that's the whole whole thing i yeah well you know one of the cardinal rules of economics is if it's a good thing government will sooner or later take it over or screw it up or yeah. both um uh, let's hope that uh digital currency will be an exception to that and the government won't figure out how to control it yeah uh you know just wondering did you ever get to meet ludwig von mises no, never met him. I missed him, I think, by a year or so. He, yeah. One of the very last uh, lectures he delivered in his 90s was at Grove City College, uh, where I earned my undergraduate degree. But I think it was one, maybe two years before I, I went there. But I studied under one of four people who earned a PhD under von Mises, and that was Hans Senholt. So I always thought I was getting yeah. my Austrian economics through Senholtz, uh, just one generation removed uh, from the master himself. Who are, who are the other three? Uh, Lou Spadaro, George Reisman, and Israel Kirzner. Uh, uh, you know, I'm not certain that Kirzner was the fourth. Reisman, Spadaro, Senholtz. Uh, I could be wrong, but there were four and maybe Kirzner was the fourth. He's still living, by the way, in his, uh, he's in the vicinity of 90. Oh, he's over 90. Uh, you know, uh, as far as I know, Reisman's still alive, too. Yes, I think so. Yeah. Uh, I, 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 didn't, I didn't know the other guy. Spadaro, you said? Uh, uh, Spadaro, S-P-A-D-A-R-O. Um, he may have been the lesser known of, of the four. And he passed away a good, uh, I think, maybe 15, 20 years ago now. 
Yeah. And Sen Holes, of course, was was also a president of the Foundation for Economic Education. Yes. Yes. And that before. You, you certainly presided over a lot of changes at FEE uh, when, when you were there. Uh, yeah, I'd like to say uh, that uh, my presidency was not only the longest, uh, 11 years, uh, but the most consequential of any fee presidency since that of uh, the founder, Leonard Reed. Of course, yes. he, his will always be the most consequential and probably will always be the longest because he was there from the founding in 1946 to his passing in 1983. What is that, 37 years? Yes. Uh, but in my 11 years, we did a lot of things. We uh, really uh, uh, took a rather inchoate or primitive uh, web presence and made it uh, a very vibrant uh, internet experience for people at fee.org. We uh, moved the headquarters from uh, our very high cost uh, New York suburb location, uh, moved it to Georgia and cut our operating costs in half. Uh, we expanded the staff dramatically, uh, uh, and uh, but it was a long, it was an arduous haul because when I took over fee, it was September of 2008, the very month that everything fell apart in the economy, and I had to scramble to cut expenses and raise revenues. But uh, we did it, and um, the deficit that was uh, in excess of a million dollars the year uh, the, when I took it over w was gone in three years and we've never had a deficit since. So our finances are the healthiest they perhaps have ever been. I, I, I can't, no experience will ever match a seminar at that mansion though. Oh, yeah, that, uh, we have that many fond memories of that. Yeah. But you know, the, the village of Irvington made it increasingly yeah. impossible for us to stay there. They, oh yeah. Oh they yeah. I understand the costs. Yeah. Yeah, they came in and said the carriage house where we used to put the female students in, up, they said, you can't use that anymore. Yeah. Unless you spend about a million dollars to upgrade the place. Yeah. You can't use the third story of your main building because oh, yeah. the staircases are too narrow. Uh, yeah. Too much the heat and to uh, air condition. Yeah. I, I mean, I could tell it was an old building, but it was just like, you know, it was just like you were part of, we were all part of one big family for a week, you know, it's. Uh, yeah. Yeah, I mean, we missed that. It just made it so. It made it. It was like you're in a frat house or something. It just made it so. <laughs> you really got to that. I mean, if I, I still remember, I it would take me some time, but I could, I could probably write down all the names of the people from that seminar. Oh, wow. Yeah. You know, it's just. Well, there are, we still do seminars more than yeah. ever. In fact, we used to do only yeah, yeah. what three or four summer seminars at Fee oh, in yeah. New York with maybe. Uh, 100 people, 120 people total, but now we're reaching tens of thousands. Oh, and yeah, yeah. You're, you're online. Always, it's always been very international, which is great. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, and, and as we should put out, point out, Leonard Reed is R E A D, and yes. Dr. Lawrence Reed is R E E D. So that's right. We were not related, yeah. uh, but I knew him well and loved him dearly. As everybody got to know him, really did. He was such yeah. a uh, fine gentleman and a wonderful scholar, a great lover of liberty. Yeah, he was. Yeah. I mean, I, I pencil is the probably is the greatest legacy. I just because that gets ex, ex, it explains it so well. <laughs> well. I was just joking with uh, our board chairman the other day that maybe we should do an update for our times of I pencil and and retitle it. I identify as a pencil. <laughs> yeah, did, it, <laughs> but of course, we would never do that. Well, I don't know. Did you see that little kids book that Julie Borowski did? Uh, it was a it was like I pencil, but it's called nobody knows how to make a pizza oh that rings a bell i and i certainly know julie i, I think i probably did see her uh, yeah I, I haven't seen her with things in recent years but i always uh, was a fan yeah but the whole concept that you have all these components that go into a pizza and mm -hmm. yeah yeah and, and julie is absolutely adorable so yeah. what do you think are the biggest mistakes people make when they promote free market ideas i mean I, I know a lot of times when we're promoting ideas, we end up shooting ourselves in the foot. Yeah. Well, I, several things, I guess I would say one, uh, they may not have mastered the elements of personality that make your philosophy appealing. Uh, and so sometimes, uh, although they may have good content, whether it's written or uh, verbal, uh, maybe they don't communicate it well. Uh, maybe they come across as, arrogant or uh, uncaring or 
uh, know it all and that kind of thing. Uh, so sometimes I, I think we met many people on our side of the fence um, uh, have to work on the personality that's involved in appealing to people. Uh, another thing is uh, we probably don't tell enough stories. Storytelling, especially when you know the, the core principle involved is a pro-freedom, pro-liberty principle. Storytelling is extremely powerful, and that's even more true the younger the audience that you're talking to. The students in particular uh, remember stories. So, it, you know, if we just lecture at them in terms of facts and figures, bottom line, green yeah. eye shades, accounting stuff, no lively stories about real people to convey the message, we're only going to go so far. Uh, but with stories, we can we can drive points home better and they stick. Um, and so those are two of the things I think where we make mistakes. And maybe a third would be uh, uh, we uh, put too much emphasis on facts and figures and too little emphasis on empathy and, and sympathy, um, emotion. Now, I, you know, there's a side of me that's very much like Dr. Spock from Star Trek. I mean, I, I, logic, reasoning, history, experience, facts, you know, those things are of critical importance. You can't win an argument without them. But I don't think uh, libertarians often enough add the emotional element, because when you're trying to convince people of the virtue of liberty, most of the time you're talking to people who are moved more by emotion than they are by facts and figures. Just the way it is. Uh, humans respond emotionally often before they respond thoughtfully. And so you can't ignore that component. You, you need to find the right mix of uh, things that tug at the heartstrings as well as uh, what uh, uh, will appeal to people in, uh, in, in their minds and in their appreciation of logic. So those, those are three things I think we make mistakes in. Uh, that's why, for instance, uh, when people say, what do you recommend that I read? Uh, depending on their interests, you know, I'll have selections from history and selections from economics, but in all of those areas, I also add uh, a couple books, uh, Dale Carnegie's classic, How to Win Friends and Influence People, and a more recent book by Olivia Cabani called uh, The Charisma Myth, The Charisma Myth. Both of those books by Carnegie and Cabani really uh, teach you things like emotional intelligence, how to appeal to people, uh, how to come across in, a, in a, a way that will make them want to listen. It isn't just facts and figures. It's, it's your demeanor. It's your personality. It's your welcoming attitude. Uh, those two books are classics. Yeah, and I, I think sometimes telling stories about how people were impacted by some of these corona policies or things like that are just as effective. Yeah, you know, when, when we talk about what government does to harm us, I mean, we could talk in terms of, you know, how much smaller GNP is because of this or that government intervention. But, you know, that's water off a duck's back with most people. If instead you talk about the real people who are denied thanks to government doing them favors, doing them good, who are denied uh, the most, most basic uh, rungs of the economic ladder, who are priced out of the labor market, who are thrown into failing government schools that continue to get more money as they continue to fail, uh, and that ruin lives in the process. If you talk about real people who have been victims of that, um, I think you're gonna go further in convincing people uh, that you have a heart and that government doesn't. Yeah, I and mean, then, you know, also, you know, just telling the more positive stories too. I mean, you know, I mean, whether it be Louis Pasteur administering a, a rabies vaccine, which was, and, and they, they, it was actually illegal, but they said, oh, this is a good thing. We won't prosecute him. Yeah. You know, and, yeah. and you know, the, or, or, or Tesla, you know, with his electric motor or Benjamin Franklin flying his kite. It's, yeah. Always, that's, a, that's a very good point, Chris. Uh, and I certainly wouldn't want to leave people the impression that all of our stories have to be negative about yeah. how people have been harmed by the government. My book, uh, Real Heroes, it came out in 2016, uh, is 40 chapters about uh, positive role models, uh, 
people in the past who have done wonderful things and it should inspire us all. So yeah, freedom has endless stories of good people who have saved lives uh, and have been able to do that either because they uh, were left alone to do it and not prohibited uh, or they had to fight for it and then used it to good advantage to liberate others. Uh, it's, liberty is such a great story full of many endless other great stories as well. Yeah, there's so many stories of people being said, you can't do this. I said, yes, I can do this. I, yeah. Even even competition produces a... Yeah, and you know, the left, the left really knows this deep down, and yet they won't admit it. But their behavior suggests they kind of know it. Because, uh, you know, look at all these uh, politicians and left-wing act activists who have been responsible for building up the welfare state. Uh, whenever they do personally give of their own resources voluntarily, and by the way, they don't have a good track record on that. They usually kind of don't do that because they think yeah. it's the government's job. But when they do give, they don't write their checks to the Department of Health and Human Services. Uh, nobody does. Nobody in their right mind says, I want to help the poor. I think I'll write a check out to the government. Nobody does that. Uh, even the left, when they want to help, they pitch in, they volunteer, or they write a check to the Salvation Army or the Red Cross. They don't send it to some government bureaucracy, even if they were in favor of creating it in the first place. We instinctively, all of us who've got, who've got half a brain, know that the last resort for helping people uh, should be to launder your money through a distant government bureaucracy. Yeah, and half of it goes. And of course, in some cases, you, they're, they're making it harder to help people. I mean, they'll, I mean, you can't give homeless people food and stuff like that. It's yeah. so it's just so ridiculous. I mean, I, I, I know one person who's, he told me my, my proudest accomplishment was helping these Venezuelans get out of Venezuela. Yeah. Is and, that uh, by chance Kyle Varner? That's who it is, yes. Okay. Uh, yeah, he's a friend. I, it was just at uh, his uh, town for a lecture, Spokane, Washington, and uh, uh, had dinner with him uh, a few months ago. Yeah, he's a hero for doing that. Yeah. Uh, I don't, yeah, it's also interesting too. I just, when you can give, yeah, I mean, what you give to people, it's rather, uh, and, and some of these, and, and, and and certainly, I mean, I, I think that's the thing. If you want, if you want everybody to have something, you need to figure out a way to make it cheap. It's yeah. because everything starts out expensive. And I, I do think there's that tendency that people see things get more expensive and they think it just happens. And they don't ask, why is this more expensive? You know, why are, why are houses so expensive in San Francisco? And I just had a guy on a few years ago talking about that. And he, he said there were younger people who are actually trying to, they actually wanted to get rid of these regulations. <laughs> yeah, housing expensive in San Francisco is it good? <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, the cost of housing, so much of it is where it is because of uh, regulation. And uh, uh, you know, it, as a general rule, if you find a, an intractable problem yeah. and everybody complains about that never seems to go away, and you wonder why is why does it persist, you'll almost always find that it persists because government is standing in the way of a solution. Government is making it too expensive to fix it. Government is denying some entrepreneur the opportunity to earn a few bucks by fixing the problem. That's almost always the case in these persistent, intractable problems that nobody can understand why they don't go away. Yeah, well, hopefully it'll move on. Hopefully we'll progress from there. It's a I, I do worry sometimes that we might be losing our, our that we're sti by stifling some of this creativity, we'll have less of it because you have to, you have to be somewhat of a rebel to do this. Yeah. And yeah. if you let people be rebels, but the, the people who are disruptive, the, the Edison who said, I can't teach this kid, you know, it's well, well, he, he did a lot of things that were pretty incredible anyway. Yeah. Well, we're like uh, Jefferson, aren't we? Who, celebrated the spirit of rebellion and suggested maybe yeah. about every 20 years we ought to have one <laughs> just to let the guys in, in power know that uh, we're keeping an eye on them. <laughs> yeah, I hope it doesn't get to that, but you know, it's uh, seem, maybe seems to be that way uh, that we'll need to have these rebellions. It's uh, rather unfortunate that we've gone. Uh, I where, where do you think of, uh, yeah, you know, that's one thing that really bothers me too, is I, I see more and more people who just want to build the walls up and I, yeah, 
I, I mm. think I think you have to have, and 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 the wall, you know, just like the Berlin Wall was used to keep the people in East Berlin. It's the, those wall. They may say those walls are going to keep these allegedly bad people out, but they're going to keep the good people in. Yeah, yeah, yeah. For the most part, and you know, when we speak of rebellions, you can there are different forms of rebellion. You can have a rebellion at the ballot box. Yeah. If you've got enough of the right people running uh, who can uh, capture the votes to unseat the bad people. Uh, and of course, then there are the rebellions that people resort to when they feel as though every other recourse has been exhausted without any uh, solution. That's what uh, Americans felt. Uh, that was the situation we thought we were in in 1776. We may uh, be in that one of these days again. I hope not. But governments have a way of... Uh, sooner or later, accumul accumulating the power that proves to be so destructive that some generation decides it's going to have, an, it's had enough. I, uh, yeah. We'll do whatever it takes to get rid of them. Um, that's sad, but that's that's been the course of history. Sooner or later, uh, we almost always have to pick up our pitchforks and get rid of them. Yeah, I, I hope, yeah, I maybe it won't come to that you know we pretty much resolved the, the covid the christ the the stuff with covid was with kind was it seemed like it went away peacefully i i don't think if people pro, if people hadn't protested though i don't think it would have went away they yeah wanted to create a new, new normal the, the the troubling thing is that the enemies of liberty still go to work every day and i don't know i i don't know what they really want sometimes i yeah, the instances of power sort of uh, giving way voluntarily uh, to the people, to wa uh, power walking away from power, those instances are, are rare enough in history that when we find people who actually do that, we write about them as heroes uh, because they're so rare. Uh, typically, power uh, tends to want more of it, and it corrupts and uh, destroys the mind. Uh, it ta power takes even the best of people and if they've got it long enough, it will corrupt them. I'm convinced, uh, without exception. Uh, yeah, you know, incidentally, uh, you know, we, we talked about you know, you know, the former, the countries that were under the thumb of the Soviet Union. What, what about? What do you think about Russia? What's 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 happened there? Yeah, you know, Russia has had so little heritage. Yeah, of of genuine freedom and so few intellectuals over the generations who uh, celebrate true liberty. Uh, there's been a strong streak in Russia as far back as I'm aware of, uh, uh, you know, the co uh, uh, collectivist uh, concentration of power, of uh, the nation above all. Uh, uh, liberty should give way to whatever that is, to uh, uh, the nation state, because that will accomplish good things for all of us, you know. Um, that's unfortunate. It really has had so little experience with liberty. I can understand why so many ordinary Russians aren't sure what it is or have a jaundiced view of it. Yeah. So, I mean, there's, I wouldn't give up hope on anybody, but uh, that's Russia's a tough nut to crack. But uh, my guess is that um, there are a lot of people today in Russia, in spite of the all-time uh, height of personal power that Putin has, who are putting two and two together and thinking of things like, wow, you know, maybe term limits would have been a good idea on this guy. Or maybe maybe once we get free of this guy, we should be a little more wary and vigilant about ever trusting anyone else with this kind of power. Uh, you just don't know what seeds are being planted in the yeah. darkness of ours that could blossom into the best of things at a later date. So I'm hoping that Russians are learning something and that uh, when the day comes that Putin is gone, that the forces of freedom will arise, have a seat at the table and uh, put Russia on a different path. But right now, under Putin, um, uh, it's hopeless. Yeah, and, and, I, I, and, and you know, another country which has a horrible record is China. It's I, I, I don't know where where we go from here. I don't. I'm, China's yeah. record might be worse. I think that might be another case where uh, the chances of a peaceful evolution into a democratic republic with personal freedoms is that that's that's not likely to happen. That for China ever to be free, there's going to have to be another revolution. Um, that may be so. I don't know, but. Uh, 
uh, it is a shame, isn't it, that people seem to learn so little from history. I want to. I find myself every day wanting to get on the rooftop and shout to people: Don't let anybody have much power or have it for very long, because you will regret it every time. The guy that you think is your savior today will be your enemy tomorrow after just a few years of all the power you're about to bestow upon him. Uh, learn that from history. Don't do that again. Uh, <laughs> that's what I'd like to cry from the top of a, my roof. Yeah, the, the, the giving up power to the alleged savior temporarily often leads to a, and sometimes, you know, it's 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 when you want to fight something. I Yeah. I, I, I do worry what what might emerge as as, as the anti woke forces because it looks a lot like what happened with the with the Weimar Republic. It was the anti woke forces there that took over the country and they and they were probably as ended up probably ended up being worse. It's well, you give uh, any people uh, the right uh, chaotic circumstances of so things like high crime, political turmoil, and uh, or threat from abroad, whatever, you create enough of a crisis and people, even good people, will accept what they would never accept in peaceful, normal times. So don't hope for a crisis because uh, that usually doesn't turn uh, the corner in the right direction. But anyway, it's been great uh, to be with you, Chris. Yeah. Anything else you want to say before we go? Well, uh, for your listeners, I'd like to say, hey, check out my website. I have one uh, at lawrencewreed.com. That's spelled L-A-W-R-E-N-C-E-W-R-E-E-D. No punctuation in there. Yeah. Lawrencewreed.com. Uh, most of what you'll see in the blog section will take you to an article I've written at Fee. Uh, so I encourage you to go to Fee as well. But uh, my website uh, has all of that stuff no matter where I've uh, published it. And, uh, and be optimistic about the future in spite of how uh, uh, disheartening current trends might seem to be because things can turn around. Those of us who believe in liberty are busy planting seeds. You never know when the right uh, uh, climate will come along, the right combination of personalities, ideas, and circumstances that bingo could produce big and sudden changes for the better. We have to hope for that. And plant those seeds so it happens, uh, hopefully, in our lifetimes. Well, we probably weren't expecting the Berlin Wall to come down in fo- within five years in 1984, so that's true. It's uh, yeah. Uh, hopefully something else. Well, I'm Chris Baker. Uh, check out my Substack and my novel, Escape from the Village, and we are out. <laughs>